Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Transfigured. I'm here with Paul Ann Leitner. Uh, we have talked with each other multiple times in the past, um, and we always get excited, I think, uh, when new topics come up. I think that this uh, conversation will be sort of mostly focused on evolution and its theological consequences and stuff like that. Um, I think that's something that we have been meaning to talk about. Um, Paul is the host of Deep Talks um, uh, podcast and YouTube channel. I'd highly recommend it. Uh, Paul does some great stuff on sort of, you know, sometimes movie commentaries or cultural analysis. Um, I've really enjoyed your stuff recently. I don't, we've never talked about that, but the embracing your cringe stuff. Hmm. I thought that that was like, like picking up your cringe and burying it. I thought that that was like brilliant. I thought that was an excellent way of sort of describing kind of the, the meta modern, meta modern Christian moment and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll pass it back over to you. Uh, what, what are some of the things that have been on your mind that you've been wanting to talk about? Yeah, Sam, thanks. I always love having conversations with you. You are so well read in a variety of subjects. And, uh, you know, you have uh, you have an intellect intellectual prowess that I'm I'm envious of. And in, in some of these conversations, I go, man, Sam's depth and breadth of knowledge is is pretty uh, is pretty impressive. You can go from sitting down and talking church history with, uh, you know, a professor of church history and, and theology and then sit down with Verveke or, you know, Dr. Jonathan Losos and talk science and faith stuff. So I always love our, our conversations. I'm sure there are huge areas of human knowledge know next to nothing about and that I look embarrassing at. I think the only topic that like I know a lot about that I don't talk about on YouTube is like um, the history of blues music and Ooh. American folk music. That, that I feel like is the only time, like when you're seeing me on YouTube, you probably anyone who's watched me regularly actually knows my main areas of expertise. So don't, don't think that there are hidden continents of Sam's knowledge that haven't been explored yet. Other than the history of like blues and American folk music. That, that's oh, the man. one thing. Well, we might have to talk about, about that sometime. <laughs> the folk area might be an area of weakness for me, but as a, you know, a long time guitar player, I've, I've always had a, a fascination with the, with the blues for years i had a stevie ray vaughn custom stratocaster yeah. you know i can't play like that but i love i love the blues anyways i think um the thing for me sam I, I was listening to your conversation we've had some points in our past dialogues where we've been talking about the intersection of science in particular like evolutionary psychology evolutionary biology and historic christian theology and i think both of us having this shared experience where we grew up in contexts that were very um you know treated the sciences i will speak from my own vantage point but you probably could affirm this they treat they treated the sciences quite uh very much like a global conspiracy to destroy your faith um and so we both came up in a tradition that was dogmatically young earth creationist uh you know ken ham lectures in my christian school and there was another guy lesser known um not never quite ascended to the level of uh ken ham internationally but dr carl baugh did you ever watch dr carl no. baugh videos that might have been more of a thing particular to like you know but you had pentecostal roots too that might have been more of yeah. a thing and i i wasn't I, I also wasn't like 6,000 years ago, young earth. Like we, oh. we taught a, a day gap sort of thing. Oh, like okay. the earth became without form and void. So there might've been like kind of a creation beforehand. Yeah. And like dinosaurs. So like gap theory. Yeah. Gap theory. And so yeah. like the six days might be 6,000 years ago, but there might've been stuff before that. And like dinosaurs, fossils and stuff like that might be from a previous aeon or something. But anyway, okay, other than I that, I mean, it that. was still it was still pretty literal, you know, creationism. Yeah, and, for sure. And, and, and so a skepticism of science and a sense that um, evolutionary biology was some sort of elite intellectual conspiracy against Christian faith and that sort of thing. Yeah. So maybe we shared that. I didn't know that that was that was we, we I was in a much more dogmatic straight up answers in Genesis Dr. Carl Ball was interesting um, and now that I reflect on it I think it was uh, maybe more particular to like word of faith charismatic streams because he would be on like the Kenneth Copeland show 
Um, and so we would sit in Bible, our Bible class in my Christian school and watch tar Dr. Carl Baugh videos on how the, the, the firmament, firmament functioned and the, the, the breaking open of the firmament caused the, the, the flood, which like in some sense is actually probably capturing the world view. Yes. Accurately. Yeah. All right. Um, John Walton would probably be like, yes. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, uh, you know, part of my experience and I've, I've told this before, but maybe for some of your viewers, they don't know this side of my story. Um, uh, you know, that was the position I even went into college feeling like this is long before God's not dead movie, but it was still very much in the water. This God's not dead. When you go to college, you are, having to defend your faith, like all the apologetics things that you had in Christian high school and Christian youth group were about defending your faith, defending your faith. Everything was framed in the language. We'd go to youth conferences that were called battleground. And it was all very much preparing you for culture war. And probably at the centerpiece in, in, in my younger years, the centerpiece of that culture war between Christian schools and your secular public schools, between Christians and the world, the centerpiece of that in my youth was science and faith issues. Yes. Yeah. That was very the, much the, the evolution creation thing was kind of one of the original culture war topics, especially mm -hmm. like late 90s through early mid 2000s. And a lot of the gasoline that gave new atheism energy in the beginning was that topic. And it's interesting because I feel like the culture has very much moved on. Um, and I'm not sure how much of that is creationism sort of fading away, even in surprisingly conservative circles. I do think there's been some of that, but I guess sexuality questions and Trump and other things have sort of taken over the spotlight. But I remember, yeah, the, the science versus evolution or creation versus evolution thing was a central thing. And there were like Supreme Court cases and all sorts of stuff about this topic. Yeah, that was definitely in my day, that was the centerpiece of the the culture war. Because I think at the time, I mean, certainly as a kid of the 80s and 90s, you were already experiencing the maybe s slower. We've gone through a much rap, much more rapid in the past. I mean, you just think about how our views culturally, and, and I'm not trying to get into like stirring up culture war passions here, but just to do a little history, you think about first term Obama. First term, Obama ran uh, against, um, you know, same sex marriage. And he mm -hmm. was, you know, I think kind of loosely like, well, we can allow s civil unions. You can't. Um, there's no possible way you could ever conceive of a Democrat. And, right. and honestly, like probably very few Republicans are still running on that. And so that was a really rapid change uh, in areas of like human sexuality and, but we were still kind of experiencing that in the 80s and 90s, but it was probably more of a collision between our subculture and the evolution of popular culture. You know, MTV, uh, mm -hmm. we'd walk around wearing t-shirts that said, kill your TV. I had friends in my church that didn't own a TV. So there was some of that. But I think the biggest thing that I felt I had to, to be prepared for heading off to university, not going to a Christian university, going to a, a liberal university was yeah. to praying to defend my faith against the godless atheists who were teaching evolution and teaching that the earth was really, really old. So that yeah. was the thing. And I remember going into college with my arguments prepared. I remember writing papers, you know, uh, <laughs> on this subject at, you know, what would we were calling liberal today, they would call progressive university, the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And so I very much remember heading into college with that sort of position. And one of the two turning points for me, Sam, and I'll keep the autobiographical stuff short so we can really get into the content, but the two turning points for me were, um, one, uh, I was a, a history major in undergrad, so I had very few science and math classes, but one of the early science classes I had was a geology class. And the professor, much to my maybe... I don't know if disappointment's the right word, but it definitely was against the character uh, characterizations I had in my mind. Professor was not adversarial to religion at all. Uh, he wasn't proselytizing in class, but he certainly um, was sensitive to questions that I had as we were going through geology and fairly clear demonstrations to 
pretty much any reasonable person that there's no way the earth itself setting aside processes of evolution there was no way the earth itself there was mounting evidence i want to be sensitive to those that still mm -hmm. listen and believe that it, it's old but the overwhelming scientific evidence was yeah right here the earth is far far older than six to ten thousand years ago i mean we probably had an ice age ten thousand years ago but it goes way beyond that and because he wasn't adversarial to my questions um it really like destroyed that caricature of someone that was out to destroy my faith. And what I found in this professor was a very reasonable gentleman that he didn't talk about his faith, but I had a general sense that there was probably some sort of Christian religious background in his, in his life because he was sensitive, aware of the topics and seemingly expressed with a lot of charity that he didn't see these things at odd, odds. So I think at that point, Sam, I became the the evidence i was like I, I i have to be essentially like a flat earther here you know to deny the 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 evidence that's in front of me for the age of the earth and, and that opened me up to maybe some of the things that you experienced when you were younger mm -hmm. which was like you know gap theory so i probably moved from that to like gap theory or what i would have called like an old earth creationist and then it was probably later in college, in fact, not really until my early adult years where I began to get a lot more serious about biblical studies, is that was at the point I started to realize, oh, hang on a second, the way I've been engaging with the text of Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3 has is a very novel innovation. Mm -hmm. um, forcing this particular scientific worldview onto the text is really something that for the most part now there certainly have been people in the past that thought you know we can do genealogies from adam and that's what takes us back to how old the first humans were um gene biblical genealogies but for the most part the the science of creationism is an invention of the 19th century um because it wasn't until the 18th and 19th century that we even discovered things like dinosaur bones in fact, mm -hmm. there were geologists going out to try to do things like uh, as part of as part of this venture of natural theology. So we're going out into the world and we are trying to use our faculties of general revelation. The 18th and 19th centuries in the West were huge on the 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 the, the influence of natural theology in our investigations of the world to try to demonstrate God's goodness in his created order. And so they went out and we have geologists going out to just try to uh, find evidence of the global flood. And what they ended up finding was evidence of multiple catastrophes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is what brought about um, kind of like the dividing line between those that were taking those findings and going, okay, all right, well, this seems to be pretty overwhelming evidence for this. And others that were doubling down and saying, no, 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 hang on. This runs contrary to a reading of Genesis 1 and 2 and 3. And so that's really where you have the beginnings. It's not really until the 19th century that you have the beginnings of um, what you would call like young earth creationism. So that really, Sam, that opened me up once I started realizing that I was imposing modern readings, a modernist reading on the text that was outside of the purview of the, the authors of the Bible that I were saying God had inspired to write the text. That for me was like, that was the light bulb. So you take people like you mentioned John Walton already, you know, John Walton's work. Um, but even before that, it was just like understanding, having a better biblical hermeneutic, realizing like my goal, if I'm saying the text is inspired, which I still hold to today, the text is inspired. I'm trying to get as close to the location of inspiration as possible. And if I trace that back through the text, I have to get to a human author in a human context that God vested his authority in. And so why would I believe that God vested this human author with inspiration to speak within his worldview, within that particular cultural frame to address issues that were nowhere in their purview at all? I don't go into the text expecting, I don't go reading uh, the Gospel of Matthew to figure out whether or not uh, you know, any of the disciples believed in quantum mechanics or not. Mm -hmm. It's like... It's just nowhere in their their purview. And so once that happened, and then I had a better engagement with church history to realize, you know, prior to maybe some of my pietist influenced Christian theology that was very much like general revelation is flawed, you know, some stuff downstream of Luther. And mm -hmm. I started to encounter like 
more historic Christian traditions, going back to Aquinas, that were like, wait, all truth is God's truth. All beauty is God's beauty. That opened me up to go, all right, if the biblical authors are not addressing this, then maybe I can follow the light of God's general revelation wherever it leads. And that has opened up a fun, exciting, and wondrous for me, Sam. And I talk with my kids about this. And we sit around our dinner table and we talk about this stuff because they are still in Christian school contexts that are still very much, for the most part, still dogmatic mm -hmm. earth creationism. And we're going to let them sort through that stuff. But when we talk about this stuff, they go, man, like God's creation is far more wondrous and mysterious than I can imagine. And it's just so much more fun to explore. So when you have, that's a long way to say when you have people on like Jonathan, uh, Dr. Jonathan Losos to talk about things like fittedness to habitat and convergent evolution, I'm trying to figure out, oh my goodness, how does this fit within what God is doing in his story? And I'm filled yeah. with excitement and wonder instead of like defensiveness, anxiety. And this yes. stuff, talking about this stuff just now lights me up. And I love talking about it with others too. I, I relate so much to what you just said. I'll be even more brief about my autobiography, but I went into college again with that same very kind of, I don't know, combative or defensive or, you know, like, yes, I'm supposed to get this education. Yes, these institutions of higher learning have a lot to offer and you're supposed to go there to learn things, but be careful what you learn. And, um, I will say, I mean, I had like I studied biostatistics in undergrad, so I took a lot of biology courses. I actually even I'll, I'll even admit I took more evolutionary biology courses than was required of me by my major because I was particularly, um, I don't know, uh, focused or stuck on on this subject. And I don't think there was any like I'm not even quite sure I, I when I could point to me being like, actually, maybe this evolution stuff is true. I think it was a pretty great. I, I evolved in my approach to this. Um, but I, I mean, I had some professors that might have fit that stereotype of that, you know, uh, angry, you know, antagonistic. God's not dead professor. <laughs> yeah, God's not dead professor. But then I had professors that were very different than that, too. And I remember I, I've only taken one philosophy course, but the philosophy professor was super um, open minded on like we spent it was philosophy 101 and we spent like half the semester looking at arguments for or against the existence of God. And she was very, you know, open minded and encouraging not to like jump to conclusions and that, you know, hey, like if you look at the history of philosophy, this is like most of what it talks about is theology. So, you know, let's be honest about that. And very, uh, you know, open minded to questions of faith. So there was a huge spectrum of professors and their approach to this. But I will say, I think the thing that maybe pushed my mind the most was meeting other Christians whose faith I respected and whom I trusted that believed in evolution. I think that that was probably more, um, had a bigger effect on my heart on this question than any particular argument or fossil or strain of evidence was meeting other Christians who are like, no, you, you, you can believe in evolution and you can still believe in the Bible and all this stuff. Here's, here's where I'm at on these questions. And I'm like, I trust this person. This, this is an upperclassman in my Christian fellowship who I admire and respect. And uh, I, I think that that had uh, a big effect on me. And I agree with you that there was some transition where it stopped feeling like evolution and Christianity was this like uncomfortable thing that I needed to figure out how to get to work to it seeming cool and exciting and a uh, an avenue for uh, like philosophical and theological growth, not just like tension and uh, I don't know, like discomfort and, and that. I don't know, maybe by the end of undergrad, maybe it took even a little bit longer than that, if I'm honest, to get to that point. It definitely took me longer, too, Sam. I'm, it, it probably wasn't until I went into grad school at, at seminary. So I, I have a master's in Christian thought. And so I went through a seminary, but it wasn't like uh, it was an academic track. Right. And um, I think the thing like you're mentioning was realizing and this is an interesting phenomenon, the, how big of a gulf there is between I went to Bethel Seminary here in St. Paul, Minnesota, which I would say probably most, there's always a spectrum to this, but I would say most people would label, it's a conservative 
like theologically conservative evangelical seminary. And when every single one of my professors were fine with whether you want to call it evolutionary creationism or theistic evolution, however you want to call it, um, that was like, oh, I'm not just kind of like a weirdo that's like reading some of this stuff on the side. And I, I always felt in the context where I was in ministry and teaching um, that I couldn't really talk about this stuff. And then realizing that in academia, like theological academia, and I'm not talking about, you know, I, I'm not talking about it. Princeton or, or Yale places people might put, point to and be like, yeah, they're, they're you know, no offense to like Miroslav Volf or someone over there for it. Yeah, but they might point to and be like, yeah, they've kind of. They're got... liberal squishes. So, you know, of course they would think that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At like, I mean, it was an advertiser. It's like a Baptist college, university, like, you know, uh, John Piper yeah. taught there. Uh, Greg Boyd too. So there's a spectrum as well. Mm -hmm. um, realizing like, oh, this is like the norm among people who have given their lives to biblical scholarship and theology. Um, this, like you're saying, it's like, oh, this is now that doesn't mean that there hasn't been intellectual and uh, what you might, I hate to parse between the two intellectual and spiritual difficulties in reconciling some facets of the way the evolutionary story has been told and our understanding of the biblical narrative. There's no doubt about that. I mean, obviously one of the great questions has to do, do with at what point would we name God's original state of goodness as good and mm -hmm. facets like predation and decay and even entropy, like no. the most ordered point in all of the history of the universe was the moment right before the big bang mm -hmm. where everything was in a completely ordered state. And it was actually entropy and that moment of the, the Big Bang, that br entropy is being unleashed into what is now the, the universe, right? Uh, we can't, it's impossible for us to even conceive of a reality in which uh, energy and matter isn't constantly being recycled. Like I, I depend whether you're a vegetarian or whether you have no problem eating animals, like I have no problem eating animals there is the destruction of some living thing that is being repurposed into you to keep you alive. And this cycle seems to go and go and go. Yeah. So there are questions about, well, is there a state? Is that good? Is that something that's part of the fall? I mean, there are hard questions here, but they're to me, Sam, like really invigorating questions too. Yeah. 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 I agree with that because I, there are like a couple angles that I think makes this question interesting. There is the scientific angle. And I mean, I, I have, I have been in the past a scientist and do find science really interesting. So that like, that's one aspect of this. Another is just sort of epistemology at large. How do we know what we know? How can we trust science? Like, how how skeptical can you be of science like like that you will get tested on that if you go down this road at starting from a creationist standpoint you know like how much can i really doubt my senses or the evidence or perhaps there was some change in how radiocarbon dating works at some point i don't i can't prove that but maybe there is and you know like you start having all these explanations that sort of build up as defenses and at some point you're like Oh, but really, do I need to keep doing that? So just epistemology at large. But then I think the most difficult and the most interesting is hermeneutics, is how do, how then do we approach Genesis faithfully? Yes. And I think that when I was going through this process, I remember from under, or not from undergrad, from high school, we did a, um, a, a series or a semester or whatever on um, the hero's journey. And we read Joseph Campbell's uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces. Um, we read uh, The Hobbit and Gilgamesh and a bunch of very sort of stereotypical hero's journey things. Sounds like an awesome class, though. <laughs> it, it actually, what, I mean, the fact that I can still remember it. I cannot remember every high school unit in English and history class, but I can remember this one. So it, it's stuck in my mind. And this idea that, that mythology had a purpose and that mythology wasn't empty or just fables or tall tales, but that there was 
or lies, yes. but that there was a structure and a purpose and a cultural usefulness for mythology. And that sort of stuck in my mind. And I remember at some point, like at probably some late night dorm room discussion with my friends on this being like, well, what if the Bible is like those myths, but they're like true? True myths. Uh, true. Yeah. Like, what if they're true myths? What if they're the God sanctioned versions of these stories? Okay, yeah, Gilgamesh has a flood story in it, and there's someone who looks a lot like Noah. Okay, you know, Hero's Journey and other stuff. What if the point is not that, uh, what if these are myths, but that's a good thing? <laughs> and, and that sort of thing. And I will say, I think probably the reason why I latched on to Jordan Peterson early on, and the, the subject of his that I found the most compelling was not necessarily the culture war and gender pronoun stuff, but the he was touching on how could Genesis be true in a way that wasn't like the literal historical way that I had grown up with, but that was convincing and powerful and was connected in a compelling way with the theory of evolution. And I think that that is what hooked me on to Jordan Peterson the most was when he started doing his Genesis series and he was wrestling with all these same ideas, but coming at it from a very different angle and with a very different set of skills than I had. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that's honestly why I found Jordan Peterson most interesting about. And still to this day, I wish he would dabble in that subject more than he does. Mm -hmm. I mean, my request for him has been to actually engage. I, I think there are tracks there where it's like, uh, he's heading broadly in the right direction i wish he would actually sit down with biblical scholars to talk about the bible you know even when he does this daily wire series and he's just saying top scholars and it's like no you have a scholar you have a professor of religion you yeah. do realize that's a very different subject than biblical scholarship and like ancient near yes. eastern texts yeah. very very different because i think what we're what i want to get at is you know, for me, I have to, this isn't just like historical, critical engagement with the scripture. Um, Kevin Van Hooser is really, really good on on this over at TED's. And um, Van Hooser, who has a book called Remythologizing Re Christianity, talks about true myth. But he also begs the question of when we engage the text, we what's the first question that we answer? Are we answering, first of all, theological questions a priori about who God is and the nature of revelation, which then lead us to then trust that the text is disclosing something true. Do we have to answer hermeneutic questions first, which is kind of, you know, like more the postmodern reordering of the questions. So we're not dealing with yeah. metaphysics first. The, the order of questions is in question with postmodernism. So we bring up questions about like Wittgenstein, Wittgensteinian language questions, right? Mm -hmm. and, and Peterson does some of that. You know, like the, the Wittgensteinian language games here. But I think the, the the thing that we're really trying to say is like, all right, if I am already approaching this from the perspective of faith and trust, like I am taking a Kierkegaardian step or leap of faith and to trusting certain things about God that I believe he's disclosed. And that posture of my heart leads me to be like, all right, I'm not just approaching the text simply as... Uh, lying as if i'm an like an objective neutral observer of the biblical text there's this guy i'm not going to name his name but uh, he's developed quite a following online as a uh, like an objective historical critical scholar of the bible and most most of his work and he's he is a very top-notch scholar most of his work seems to be focused on like deconstructing and dispelling p people's particular beliefs about the bible which in in some ways are not in keeping with like scholarship on it. The thing is though, when you engage with the text from the perspective of going like, I am an objective neutral observer of the text, you're lying. Like we all have, and this is where people like Van Hooser are really, really helpful. This is where postmodern theology can be helpful. It's helping us realize that we come to the text with convictional locations already, like situated. So when I engage with it, like I'm engaging with it from a different perspective from Peterson, because I'm saying I'm committed to this, this Jesus, I'm like mm -hmm. part of the church, you know? And so when I do that, I'm actually in my hermeneutic can lead to maybe some similar places where I engage with the text 
in a particular way. But what's driving me is like, I want to know, again, I mentioned this already, can I get as close to the location? If I assume, which I'm already making like this committed assumption to something that we might call inspiration, when I do that, I have to work through the epistemology and hermeneutics of my my biblical reading. And in that, if I'm saying I'm trying to get as close to the location of inspiration as possible, I'm here in 2024, Minnesota, Midwest American. I engage with the text with a particular lens that isn't the lens that the author had about the world or the cultural context. And so I don't, I'm not really wild about like, I don't need like, it's kind of fun. I don't need like a Jungian reading of Genesis. Now, Mm -hmm. what I want to do is figure out, does the original author and audiences or authors and audience, are they coming from a worldview that would tell these stories in mythological form? And if the answer is yes, do you see how like, like Peterson's hermeneutic emphasizes the Jungian approach, which may have some parallels with an ancient mm-hmm. myth, mytho, mythologizing of a story mm-hmm. to tell true myth, but our approaches to get there are different. And I don't want to get hung up on that point, but it does open up a world to say, there are truths that will sit atop. So if in a hundred years from now, which we already are experiencing changes in the, and this is also important, a Darwinian narrative is a narrative. It's a story mm-hmm. that has yes. sets of philosophical assumptions, theological assumptions about yes. it. There's no data that's just objective neutral. So right. when when Darwin frames, you know, or this really wasn't, you know, I don't think it actually was Darwin that ever called it survival of the fittest. It was those mm-hmm. after him that called it it's survival of the fittest. You are framing that differently than some of the contemporaries of Darwin that saw it as, um, oh, I can't remember the guy's name. There was a contemporary of Darwin that looked at creation and saw essentially creation acting as a, a myriad of happy creatures living in balance and equilibrium together. Mm-hmm. That's a different narrative than saying survival of the fittest, which then, of course, had implications in history in social Darwinism. So if yes. we accept that narrative, so all of these things are very, very different than saying, I am open to the engagement of science, but I'm also bringing, because we all have an implied theology, whether we're aware of it or not, I am now going to bring my theological engagement with the data to assess what stories we tell about the data. And you know who's been really good on this? I highly recommend is Sarah Coakley. Sarah Coakley is really, really good at um, a theologian, British theologian. She has been really, from my vantage point, engaging with the scientific, new fascinating insights, relatively new fas- fascinating insights on things like altruism, cooperation that we see in nature. And the question that she is bringing up and has brought up as well as others like um, Nancy Percy. Nancy Percy is, I believe she's been at Fuller. Um, They're bringing up the hermeneutic lens by which we are reading what's happening in nature. Yes. And so you could emphasize a story that's like the dominant alpha always wins. And it's just survival of the fittest. And, you know, even Peterson has hints of this sometimes. He's like, you got to embrace your monster, man. Mm -hmm. Right. But then he also has been helpful in saying it's not the dominant alpha in the chimp troop that reigns for a very long time. There has yeah. to be some element of cooperation. So or Brett we're... Weinstein saying something like evolution is a giant spelling bee that ends in genocide. It's like, well, that's quite a narrative to slap on top yes. of this. Yeah, That's a narrative that mm-hmm. already has a presumed philosophical set of assumptions, theological set of assumptions, even if you don't want to name them as theological. So when I come to my observe, my process of meaning making, and I say like, for me as a Christian, I am coming with Christ as the hermeneutic key to reading it because everybody has a Christ figure that functions functionally Mm -hmm. as Christ, as the Lord over all of their their highest values. They might not name it as Christ, 
but they have something that they name as Lord, which then becomes their hermeneutic lens that they are interpreting the world by. So I'm, I'm working on a, a series right now on the flow state that uh, engages the work of uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who I, I finally got right after practicing a million times for that series. And Csikszentmihalyi's book on flow is really, really fascinating, but he starts with the assumption that the universe is mindless, random, chaotic, and that religions have functioned as what he called cultural shields to protect us from the absolute horror that we exist in this mindless, chaotic universe. But in the end, he's like, the key to happiness, and this is way oversimplification, the key to happiness in this mindless, chaotic world is figuring out how to tap into the flow state. So for me, it's like almost a form of Epicureanism, which is like, yeah. you know, like, which also had a chaotic, atomistic exactly. uh, cosmology, right? There, oh, it, the universe is just particles bumping into each other. There, there really isn't purpose or logos in the sense of the way that the Stoics think that there is. And we're just here to surf in the chaos and, you know, catch the best wave you can, man. Right? Exactly. So yeah. that assumes a theological story already with it. So what I'm saying, mm -hmm. Sam, is when I listen to your stuff and I, I know we, we, we've never really parsed out, you know, our own maybe differences on Christology, but that that's fine for now. Some listeners might be like, it's not fine, <laughs> but it's yeah. fine for now. If, if we're, if we're saying like this story, we have committed ourselves to it. I'm very much open to the possibility. I, I could be wrong, but in faith, I've committed myself to Christ and Christ has become the hermeneutic key. So now when I see things in and my meaning making endeavors and I in the scientific disciplines that make me go, oh my gosh, what do I do with that? Does that fit within this particular reading of the story? And I try to step back, check my biases, and I do listen to people that have different stories. I go, which story seems the most coherent? Chick sent me high story, even though his scientific investigations into flow are phenomenal. Like great scientific research the way he weaves that into a story doesn't make sense to me mm -hmm. world's mindless mm -hmm. chaotic it's completely void of any sort of objective purpose but hey just find a way to get in the flow state as much as you can because you will experience more life satisfaction i step back and go that for me is like a less coherent story than a story in which there is order and hierarchy and there's a structure to reality that's been ordained by mind like mind and not mm -hmm. just matter yeah. and if i live in accordance with that story and i because he's all about you have to rightly structure your attentional hierarchy to be focused on the things that bring you into flow state great but where does that ordering come where, where did that hierarchy come from yeah why yes. why can't i do that what does that yes. say about the universe i'm part of this universe if my mind yes. can do that and my mind was shaped by this universe, what does that mean about the next level up the cosmological hierarchy and that sort of thing? Okay, so let me tie this together, Sam, because I look at that and I go, I think, I'm confessing I'm biased on this, but I think this is a better, more coherent story through the lens of Christ. So when, we, when I hear you talk to Dr. Jonathan Losos about convergent evolution and like convergent evolution, so for example, like, the classic example of convergent convergent evolution is the development of wings and birds, bats, and insects. Mm -hmm. They have very different ancestries. We can verify this with genetic DNA research on them. Very different ancestries. Each of these groups have developed an ability to fly because environmental pressures led to similar evolutionary outcomes, even though they were in different habitats. They yeah. each at some point developed this adaptation that made it more possible for them to evade predation, pass on their genetic code, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one example. Um, there are lizards. There's the thorny devil lizard in Australia and the horned lizard in North America. They are mm -hmm. unrelated. Yeah. They, they are not part of the same family. They have different species. They have different body shapes and colorations. Yeah. They, I'm sorry, they've developed similar body shapes and colorations that help them blend into the, the desert environment. Or right. look at a shark and a dolphin. Very similar shapes. Yes. Although you can notice some things, right, in the pattern might be arbitrary, right? Dolphins have a horizontal tail and sharks have a vertical tail. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe it doesn't matter which of those two you are. You need one of them, 
But yes. you do need a strong dorsal fin and a very tube-like shape and super smooth skin and fins at kind of like, you know, triangle angles so that you can stabilize yourself as you're going fast. And because of those constraints, dolphins and sharks often look quite similar to each other. Yes. Right. And, and because they're solving the same problem, they're coming from different places, but they arrive on answers that are very similar with a couple of interesting differences along the way. Yeah, and you talked about guppies with uh, with, yeah. with, with Dr. Losos, right? And the guppies that are in areas where there are predators have more muted colors because that mm -hmm. adaptation keeps them from standing out to a predator being eaten. And if you get eaten, you can't pass on your genetic code, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're in a place with less predation, you develop, you are able to develop more beautiful colors that will allow you to attract a mate. Yeah, yeah. Which then you yeah. can pass on your and the crazy thing about his research and others right is how quickly those environmental pressures can produce evolutionary changes right which yeah. is wild so you know if we end up getting to a point where like we realize oh man evolution can happen much more quickly and maybe we have something more like a gap theory where it's <laughs> yeah. like yeah the the physical geography of the earth but yeah. living things were here for a much shorter time whatever i don't care about that what I right. It, it, it is funny, though, because that is one of those things that creationists would say is that actually yeah. evolution can happen much faster than those biologists think it can. Totally. And, and to be fair to them, there has been more evidence, I feel like, in the last couple of decades of how quick evolution in some circumstances and for some traits can happen. But yeah. going from like invertebrates to vertebrates, that probably doesn't happen very quickly. Or, But going from a flamboyant guppy who's got all of these flashy colors to attract the girls, all of a sudden a predator gets in my pool of the river. And then five or six generations later, the male guppies are very plain colored and don't have the flamboyant colors to attract the females because the predators eat them easier. That can happen in like three to five years <laughs> so like yeah. yeah so if that stuff ends up making a, a different evolutionary timeline i'm cool with that i want to be clear whenever i talk about this stuff, i am not saying the biblical authors were teaching evolutionary creationism either mm -hmm. i'm saying it's not on their purview at all just yeah. like if you would have asked if you would have asked the apostle paul what's a t-rex he would have been like what are you talking about yeah, you mean a dragon? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then you, then you start getting into yeah, right, a whole right. other weird area of like, what were dragons yeah, and where did yeah. those ideas come from? Mythology. <laughs> and then the young Earth creationists come in, they're like, it's Leviathan. It was around at the same time. Mm -hmm. If that yeah. ends up all being the case, <laughs> great. I, I, I'm, I'm saying that's not in the purview of what the inspired authors are, are trying to communicate. All right, so you take the guppies, right? But you mentioned this with Dr. Losos. It appears that it's not just like outward anatomical changes. We could actually see the environment creating what we might call, using anthropomorphic language, personality changes in a species. Mm -hmm. And this, yeah. you mentioned uh, in conversation with one of my favorite books of the last few years I've read is uh, Friendly Foxes. Um, the, the research about the, the, the domestication of foxes in Siberia and um like brief recap if you have no idea what i'm talking about i, I don't remember the scientist's name i should probably pull yeah. it up i think um, it was a russia a, a very russian sounding name but i don't dmitry Bel belyev okay so mm -hmm. 1950s in in russia he, they start um breeding foxes based on what we would call friendliness so the most friendly and most docile of foxes they continued to breed and over uh, didn't take that that long a time, you know, uh, over several generations, what they started to see were physiological anatomical changes and what we might call as personality changes. So here were the, here were like the primary changes that happened. And I, I would, I'd have to look up again, how many, um, generations it took, I think 15 to, been, 20 15, 15 to 20, 15 to 20. Yeah. 15 to 20 generations. So really not that long of time. So yeah. there were physical changes. Um, we went, we saw an increase in the foxes, uh, having floppy ears, shorter tails, changes in coat color patterns. Um, this is all characteristic of domestication, mm -hmm. softer teeth, yeah, softer teeth, right? Mm -hmm. Um, this is what we would see is the difference between a wolf and a domesticated dog. We started yeah. to see this by just breeding for friendliness. 
Right. The reproductive and, and their tails thing. get floppy and, and they get spots. Yeah. <laughs> right? They start looking like Dalmatians and other sorts of weird breeds that we already know of dogs. And they weren't selecting for any of that at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then you also and, have reproductive changes too. Reproductive changes. So like the domesticated foxes, the friendly foxes after those 15 generations, they showed changes in their pre reproductive cycle. And so they began to have a wider window for being able to breed. So often they would go into heat twice a year instead mm -hmm. of their wild counterparts, which had a narrower window, which yeah. often brings to the question like, I want to get to some questions about the implications in this for humanity and what God is doing as a telos in creation. But, you know, humans, you know, we don't have, humans don't go into heat, you know, just once or twice yeah. a year and here's your window to breed. You know, so there's, I'll get to some of that cool. later, but the reproductive changes are signs of domestication, right? Developmental changes. So domesticated fox keep juvenile features longer into adulthood. So you could say they don't go through puberty until later mm -hmm. as well. Right. There are skull changes, other physical feature changes that made them appear to actually, even as they entered into adulthood, to look more cute and juvenile their changes in right. hormone levels this is another one that i just found really interesting is that the friendlier foxes had less uh stress hormone in their bloodstream as a base level of their stress hormone so they are just generally calmer they're not as stressed mm -hmm. in their environment they have different vocalizations so they uh they sound more like domesticated dogs and yippy and barky as opposed to howly. Yeah. Yes. And they have reduced fear responses in comparison mm -hmm. to their counterparts. Now, I, I just want to compare this list with something else, Sam, and then I want to get your thoughts on it. I've done a lot of talking here, but let me throw this out here. Okay. So when I started thinking about that, one of the questions that they bring up in that friendly foxes book is they start looking at that list. And they start looking at other domesticated animals. And the question comes up, has something domesticated humans? Yeah. Yeah. Have humans self-domesticated? Self-domesticated, yeah. Yeah. And of course, there's like, you know, you get into weird ancient aliens territory with. But typically, the domestication process works when you have something above something in our case, like we domesticate dogs. In that case of the friendly foxes experiment, humans forcibly you know mm -hmm. domesticated but there are signs when we look back to our ancient hominid ancestors that humans have undergone a similar process of domestication so here's some of those features reduced aggressiveness so similar to how domesticated animals we can look back and go humans have formed these social groups and if you think humans are aggressive, just look at chimpanzees or gorillas yes. or something like that. And the number of violent interactions per day that a chimpanzee has compared to a human is like mm -hmm. off the charts. It's like a totally. hundred or a thousand times more or something. Totally. Like that. Mm -hmm. Changes in physical appearance. So we can actually go back into the fossil record with early, earlier hominids, Neanderthals, and then we get into Homo sapiens, even earlier Homo sapiens. And we see compared to our wild ancestors, we have smaller teeth, smaller skulls. We have changes in coloration. We have changes in the amount of body hair. We have experienced delayed maturation and extended childhood. And I'm even like, this is just like an anecdotal theory, Sam. I feel like we are experiencing potentially, I've got no papers to back this up, but more. I see, I see yes, these more videos. More of the same thing now. Yeah. I see like, yeah. I look back and people do this. Like, it's not just the hairstyles, right? You look back at the way high schoolers looked even 50 years ago, let's say during World War II, and not just because it's in black and white, it obviously looks older. It lo it's appears to me, even just from my vantage point, that even recently there has been a delayed onset of maturation among teenage human beings. Now, over time, we have a lot of evidence that shows humans have a much longer childhood and period of dependence on adults compared to other primates. And it seems like that was probably the case for, for early homo species as well. Extended developmental period. Um, genetic evidence shows that like brain development um, has, has changed over time. The size of our brain, I might've mentioned that one already. So the question that many biologists have been wrestling with as this information has become more readily accessible is what 
domesticated humans, the prevailing theory obviously is self-domestication, right? That there's been some mm. process. Now, in the natural the naturalist story, that has been like an unconscious self-domestication. And it's like, what have been the factors that have led to that? My question for you, Sam, I wanted to wrestle with is I look at this and I go, okay, is there a telos to convergent evolution, like a fittedness? So we will use some verveki terminology. We've got emergence, which is mm -hmm. the bottom up processes and emanation. Then emanation are the top down processes, which can provide the constraints, the limitations, yeah. the playground by which you can emanate or you can emerge up into the emanation, right? And they're yeah. going and working together. Is there like a telos to convergent evolution and to the proper ordering of creation that is leading to, and this this, this might be a crude term, but a, a healthy and proper domestication of humanity away from yeah. violence, away and into some state of, when I think about like eschatological visions, that the, the biblical prophets foresee lions lying down with lambs, swords into plowshares, areas of peace with less, you know, an epoch not marked by violence. I think about, you know, increasing domestication, a, a friendlier fox thing happening mm -hmm. in humanity. Is there something that God is doing through the process of creation, which is leading us to a particular telos? Am I looking, am I importing too much of maybe my own theological connections? Into what I don't I'm think saying? so. I, what do you, tell me your thoughts. <laughs> sure. So one thing that I want to say, first of all, is I really like hearing you think because I feel like I can hear some of the meta modernism just in the way that you approach problems. Hmm. Like modernism would have said, Oh, if you have biases or blind spots or a perspective, you need to do your best to get rid of those so that you can reach towards the objective monarchical vision scientific one. And then the postmodern problem is like, well, wait a minute, that's just one perspective among many. There are many, perhaps infinite possible perspectives that one could read a text with. You know, I mentioned this on Luke's live stream the other day. How many different ways are there to read Moby Dick? You know, how many different English PhD theses can be written on Moby Dick? Well, seemingly an infinite number of them, you know. Okay, so now there's an infinite number of perspectives. So like all of them are arbitrary and meaningless. And I feel like metamodernism is sort of being like, well, you know, it actually is true that you can read things from different perspectives. Correct. But are they all sort of equally valid? Are, uh, and it's not that there's a monarchical, absolutely true perspective, but it's like there's a perspective that has a better right relationship with the thing mm -hmm. that accomplishes some sort of purpose. In our collaboration like together, Sam, which we're doing, which is why I love talking to you, knowing like we've got some overlap, but we also have some divergent perspectives. And that's why you have dialogue with a bunch of different mm -hmm. people. So you can share from your convictional location and go, we all have a bias because the, the bias helps us filter reality. We can't take yeah. it all in. And so all I'm trying to do is like, here's my reading of the world. I'm sharing it with you, Sam. What do you see? And if we do that a bunch and crowdsource and we find a bunch of points of harmony together, then we might yeah. be closer to something that we say, all right, there's all these points of harmony. Where are the points of dissonance? Now we're actually like getting somewhere. Yeah. And connecting your interpretive perspective to action and then that action having results that yield success or failure is kind of part of the feedback mechanism too. Because we talked, you know, I, I will get to the foxes and the um, self-domestication of humans. I'm circling back, I'm, I'm grabbing a couple threads I'm from our, uh, the conversation and I, I will get to the foxes. Yes. Um, and like we talked about, there are different ways of kind of describing the process of evolution. Is it the survival of the fittest? Is evolution, this process that brings about this sort of harmonious ecology of beautiful cooperation? Is it a spelling bee that ends in genocide? Well, if you think it's survival of the fittest, that might, you know, lead to a political philosophy that looks like Nazism. 
right? And, and and that and like one of those things that our Christian upbringing was right about is oh. that those Nazis were very self consciously influenced by the interpretation of Darwinism in their day. Yeah. And like I'm sure you remember, like, hey, if you become a Darwinist, that's one step away from being a Nazi, right? Like I, mm -hmm. I remember being taught that. I bet that you were too. And there's something kind of right about that. But is that the right way to? to interpret evolution and how, what do we make of the fact that the Nazis lost, you know, like yes. that's an interesting point of history too. You know, if you get all of your neighbors angry at you and you can get the United States to cooperate with the Soviet union who are not natural cooperative partners, cause they're both scared of you. Well, that's not a very good survival strategy. Right. So anyway, group so, selection like, in group selection groups. terms, our group, one, now you might be able to say, hey, we need to step back and take a longer time frame to be able to properly evaluate that. But I think you can certainly say the Nazis lost. Now, whether or not our particular narratives and the particular values that we hold to are going to adapt to the transcendent good so that we can keep having, this is where this all connects to me, Sam, we can keep having successful groups, groups mm -hmm. that are marked by like... <laughs> what is a success? Like what's a successful group? Well, even in like strict bio biological terms, you would say, well, you continue to survive. You are able to continue to pass on your genetic code and you have enough resources to be able to do that. Now yeah. the Nazi story was one that was deriving a lot of that social Darwinist from mm -hmm. that social Darwinist narrative. And I think we can look at that and go, no, that is a failed interpretation and of the data. reading yeah. it's a failed hermeneutic right it was a hermeneutic it, it was, was possible and yeah. it was able to embody yeah right so it, in that sense it's not like false in the sense that it couldn't exist no but it was a possibility among alternatives that lost do the nazis always lose and i think oh, the yeah. answer is yes and yeah. i think this is where like when i look at convergent evolution I go, if you give the same, em, from, from an emanation standpoint, you give the same top-down constraints, you put something in this environment, it's going to adapt to the environment in a particular way. So mm -hmm. you can replay this story. You could put the Nazis on Mars and they lose, right? That's why the Empire loses in Star Wars. It's, it's Nazis yeah. in space. Mm -hmm. Any Nazis that we see in space and sci-fi also lose as well. Yeah. The Nazis all always lose. Because you can put them into different, slightly different conditions. And what I'm saying is at the top of it all, you have your local habitat and environment. But that is like, there's something atop of that and yeah. something atop of that. And we scale that all the way up. I'm asking the question of what is maybe in some sense, like not just ultimate reality, but like the environment of all environments. Yes, yes. Does yes. that description make sense? Yes. And I think that there are, a, so tying this back to humans, I think that there are a couple things that are very interesting about humans is that one of our, one thing that's very unique about human evolution and the human species is that we can survive in many different environments. Most animals are hyper specific. Some are more general and some are pretty general, like dogs, ironic, wolves and dogs, honestly, you have to give some credit for being among the most general species that there are. Group-based social predator of large things mm -hmm. is actually a pretty general thing. And if you get that right, then you can be in the Arctic, you can be in Africa, you can be in Australia, et cetera. But so I think that there, what's interesting is that there's something closer you get closer to the top of that cosmological hierarchy of truth that you were sorry talking about, the more omni-environmental your mm. strategy is. Um, whereas if you're some butterfly that can only exist off of some particular plant in some particular valley of Peru, you might be a perfectly beautiful butterfly, and I'm not trying to put that butterfly down, but there's something kind of too idiosyncratic about you that... Um, so, okay, so what if there's, you know, what if the environment changes too much? Well, then you're toast. Right. And so... Um, you can adapt for that environment. Yeah, right. And so you, you can see that a lot. And so I think that one way that you can think about humans being on top of sort of the hierarchy of creation is our 
omni-environmental ability. Uh, and that, that is something that, like, why, you know, the Bible talks a lot about humans being sort of the crown of creation mm -hmm. and that God has given us some sort of authority and dominion over other creatures and that there isn't some other embodied creature that's like us. And I think you can connect it to that idea. And I think you're you're right about the, the foxes and the humans. So neotni, right, is sort of the word that you were talking about that, but didn't say neotni is the scientific word for carrying traits of an infantile or a juvenile version of the species longer into adulthood. And neotenization, neotenization uh, I hope that I pronounced that correct, is the process when evolution favors and drives the selection of um, examples of the species that carry juvenile traits longer and longer into adulthood. And under some circumstances, that, that is helpful because when you're selecting for foxes that are um, approachable by humans, like that Siberian researcher was, it turns out that the selective, that selective force, the quickest way for biology to adapt to that pressure is like, well, actually, wait a minute, juvenile foxes are actually already pretty okay with being approached by strangers, but it's the adult foxes that aren't because the adult foxes are skeptical of other things and need to be scared of other foxes and prepared to fight them or, you know, to take down the hares or to run away from a larger predator. So they have, they're have they much more skittish and paranoid and combative, whereas the juvenile foxes are like, oh, I'm being taken care of by mommy, my, by daddy, by this fox, by this fox, oh, whatever, whatever, right? So they already have that trait of approachability by strangers. So the selective force of approachability by strangers drives the selection of neotenization. And then there's like a dial, there's like one dial that is like the neotony dial. And so you start cranking up the neotony dial and then all of a sudden you get floppy ears and adult foxes. Well, baby foxes have floppy ears. And so if you drive up the neotony dial, then adult foxes floppy ears. Mm -hmm. Baby foxes have weird spots and coloration kind of to camouflage in their environment in a different way than a hunting fox needs to camouflage. Well, all of a sudden the adult foxes kind of look like these weird spotted flaky, you know, blotchy juvenile foxes. And so that is really the, the shared trait. So how did humans do this? I think that the best answer I've heard is that um dominant males who were perhaps too aggressive and too violent would be taken down by cooperative groups of less violent more cooperative males mm -hmm. and that this sort of process of two or three beta males killing the angry alphas or however you want to put that was one of this key drivers that um, selected for neotenization in humans. Because what's interesting, when you look at a baby chimpanzee, it looks a lot more like a human does than that grown-up chimpanzee. Yes. And, and when you look at baby Neanderthal skeletons or baby Homo erectus skeletons, they look a lot more like a grown-up human than the adult version of the species does. And so I think that there's been millions of years of pressure on humans to neotenize and that that is one of the defining traits of Homo sapiens. And that makes us friendlier as adults. It makes us less grumpy, less angry. It means that like, I bet that, you know, if you think of like the most Chad masculine looking human being that you can imagine, but you compare it to a, like a Chad Neanderthal, like not even close, like, you know, the super strong eyebrow and really big bones and stuff like that of a Neanderthal, way more masculine than you could say. And I will say there's something somewhat emasculating about the process of neotenization. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's all this kind of sort of like, are, is our is our society too feminizing of men and do we need a little bit more masculinity? So I think that part of that is that kind of inner group struggle, but I also think part of it is probably group selection too. Um, because I think that this is, I think David Sloan Wilson does an excellent job of pointing this out, that really the only way to make sense of humans is that we have been highly group selected to be good members of human groups 
even sometimes at our own individual benefit within a group, but it's better to be in a good group and be a somewhat of a sucker within a good group than to be a hyper selfish person that then destroys the quality of your group. And then the larger group next door comes and beats your group. And you can imagine similar to wolves for a long time, humans lived in some geographically confined space where they might have three or four border human groups mm -hmm. that they were always in struggle with. And if you can have a more cooperative group and part of it is being able to yield a good army, like when you go to war so that the guys are hyper, you know, my brothers in arms, I'm going to lay down my life on behalf of the group. But also if you can be good at sharing and good at utilizing your resources and good at distributing skills and specializing and hunting and gathering and building this mm -hmm. and building that and all of those sorts of leadership skills and servant skills and whatever, if you can have a group that's highly functional at utilizing the resources within your turf, then you'll slowly take over the turf of your neighbors. And so I yeah. think that you group take selection- over, Take over might not even be the right word. Slowly right? accumulate or something, yeah. Well or harmonize or harmonize yeah right so even like i'm not like challenging you on that sam but i just think even some of the inherited language that we have around this still is set around uh, like dominance mm -hmm. vocabulary when it's possible when we look back like one one theory regarding like how did homo sapiens emerge victorious over the neanderthals you know people can speculate about well we just like physically dominated them that's probably not the case in fact we probably intermarried mm -hmm. and we the homo sapiens came up with more successful strategies for continuing to propagate our species which doesn't necessarily mean that we had to do it in a way that was taking from theirs yeah right yeah. and so when we think about the the yeah, groups, that's a good point. The group selection competition, if you will, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily that like we have to have. We have to we win have, every time we go to war. Right. War but we can have a higher population density within our own turf because we're better at utilizing our resources cooperatively. Yeah. So we have twice the density of our neighboring group. And mm -hmm. through some process of intermarriage or slowly over time, our group just out reproduced their group and we absorbed them. But our genes were a bigger slice of the pie in the you know generations thereafter. Yes. And what what group is more likely to have long term success? The the traveling raiding bandits or the ones that figured out agriculture mm -hmm. and can stably reproduce and pass down inst through institutions that they develop culture, language, practice. And so yeah. this for me has deep connections to religion too, Sam, is that yes, yes. each culture has an ultimate story that guides their moral injunctions, that guides their community standards. And for me, religion is, near, is, is simply naming that story that is the highest story that tells you what is of ultimate value. Yeah. Um, who's the guy's name? He does hardcore history. Gosh, Dan uh, Carlin. Dan Carlin. Yes. Dan Carlin, hardcore history. And I was listening to his series on the Vikings and really fascinating series. I love his stuff. But he had this kind of throwaway line that I had to sit with me a while. And he was like comparing like why the Vikings died out compared to the rise of Christendom. And it wasn't that like, okay, well, did, did the Christians just develop better armies? It's like, no, he's like, and this, this was his throwaway line. And it was like, you can tell a lot about a culture by who gets the good seats in the hereafter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if the good seats in the hereafter in Viking culture for warriors, you're going yeah. to put out what he often, often describes as the, you know, the, the cultural carrots and sticks that incentivize yeah that kind of behavior to the but point where almost every viking their main dream was to die in battle yeah I mean, way better to die in battle than to die of old age uh, yeah and because then some... you could get a better seat at the table in valhalla yes and this is really hard this is gets to like the stuff that's hard to wrestle with with like a, like a, a christian reading of reality 
is that mm -hmm. if anybody does like a 23andMe or an Ancestry.com, you're probably going to find some Scandinavian in you. <laughs> Especially if you're in the upper Midwest. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> and, and that's because of the Vikings. Because they got they out. Were, they were good for a while. Yeah. I, and they uh, they were good at spreading uh, spreading their seed. We'll put it, we'll put it that way. So but, I, I, ha I have an idea that I want to throw it by yeah. you related to the Vikings and yeah. the Nazis. Yeah. That my definition may be of evil itself. Like what is evil is patterns that work well in the short term, but often have long term detrimental consequence. Mm. And that it's somehow a imitation of goodness because it's able to exist for a while. But there is something within that pattern itself that has the seeds of its own destruction because it's only a short term thing like mm -hmm. addiction mm -hmm. in an individual human life is like this. Like, yep. oh, man, those highs from the drug are really good. But, you know, you get addicted to that drug and do that for a couple of years and it will destroy you. Um, so there's like a short term benefit followed by a long term, highly negative consequence. Mm -hmm. And that evil is like this thing that's able to kind of be a parasite. And I think parasite really is like the right analogy that it's sucking goodness or it's sucking being off of goodness because evil in itself in the final analysis can't exist. Right. But it's able to exist in the short term because it's like being a parasite off of the storehouses that have been built up by goodness, but it's a short-term strategy that ultimately extinguishes itself. And yeah, the Vikings were good for a couple hundred years of, you know, have this hyper warrior culture, you steal and raid from your neighbors, you take their stuff, you desecrate even their most holy institutions and you bring it back and whoever gets the biggest booty and has conquered the most stuff and brought home the most women and slaves, they get the best seat at the Valhalla table in the hereafter. Okay, they were quite good at that for a couple hundred years and it benefited them for a couple hundred years. But there is ultimately something, the, the shadow of that strategy is you will make Alfred the Great who... Yes will be the Christian who will establish the kingdom who can beat you because it's more self-sustaining and isn't built on taking from others, but it is built on being itself strong and it will eventually get strong enough to beat the Vikings. Yeah. And this is where you see this played out in, uh, I forget his first name. I think his last name was Muir, M-U-I-R. He was a biologist at Purdue and his uh, super chickens experiment. Maybe you're familiar uh, yeah, with this one. Yeah. yeah right? I think yeah. we maybe even talked about this before, right? Where he selected the um, the what would appear in you know the social Darwinist terms to be the most fit hens for reproduction, the biggest, the strongest. They also happen to be the most aggressive, but they, as individuals, would produce individually. They produce more eggs than the kind of average hens. So he took mm -hmm. the ones that individually produced the most eggs, and they were the most physically fit the most aggressive, the strongest, and he put them all in one coop. And then he put the average chickens, but they were docile friendly. Mm -hmm. And over time, what ended up happening was all but I think one or two of the super chickens pecked each other to death. Right. And the average but docile friendly chickens produced more eggs, substantially more eggs in the long run than the super chickens. And so, I bet that's related to the Neoteny thing that we were talking about yes. in the foxes and the humans is that like those like super alpha males who can, you know, take all these resources for themselves and are often self-beneficial at the expense of their group, right? And it's that's a hard problem to deal with because they're also probably accumulating women and sexual access. Right. So it's it's a pattern that like, in at the individual level is very self-replicating, but it's mm -hmm. harming the group. And mm -hmm. so the groups that have better ways or just fewer of those selfish alpha males or the the alpha chickens even, you know, will lose out to the groups that have more harmonious cooperation and better uh, resource utilization among everybody. Yeah. Can you name, this might seem like it's a, a rabbit trail, but it's connected. Can you name, even in fiction, a villainous super group a villainous super group? Yeah, villainous um, super team. Well, like the Assyrians <laughs> or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. So no. Or, okay, let's let's just take let's just take like um 
you can probably name some superhero groups, yeah. right? You got Justice League, you got yeah. Avengers. We struggle to even conceive of villainous super groups. And the thing that always you run up against, what do they oh, call Oh, I and, see what you mean. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like groups of Lex Luthors, groups of Jokers, that mm -hmm. when they go head to head with maybe a, a singular superhero that has altruistic, uh, we would say embodies in many ways like Christian virtues, they may experience some short term success. But like, let's take like all the Justice League stories. You get Superman and Batman, Wonder Woman and Flash, you get them all together. And then they have to go up against Lex Luthor's, you know, he always tries to assemble a supervillain team. And what happens? The supervillain team always collapses Fights from each other. Yeah. within because a house divided against itself cannot exactly stand. and evil is always divided against itself because it's too selfish yes and that's why uh, as a group selection game the group selection game they will lose mm. right and so what i'm thinking about here is what i'm thinking about here is what what are the uh, this pardon this language uh, it's probably not the best way to describe it what are the rules of the game yeah you know and if we have a mindless chaotic random universe of chance um i can't find any reason other than maybe like maximizing my own hedonistic pleasure because to experience pleasure is better than to experience pain. Mm. Um, so maybe I go with Mihai Chiksent Mihai, and I'm not trying to villainize him. Brilliant. He was a brilliant guy. But I just don't see why pursuing the flow state in my life other than for hedonistic, and I'm not saying like Playboy Mansion hedonistic, but more like as a result of Epicureanism, sort of I'm just disciplined. Kinda, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I'd rather have that than pain. Okay. Mm. I got that. But what if there were an overarching set of rules to the game for which group selection, the teams that will win in the end are the ones that most abide by the highest rules. Yes. So you can see over the short term, uh, let's take like, let me compare this to basketball, right? Um, there's a team down in Iowa, a college team, Grinnell University, and mm -hmm. they play this really, really fascinating system of basketball where they just press all game long and they're going to shoot the first available shot that they get so their total point scores are like usually like in the 130s or 140s they've had players and this is like a division three school they've had players that have scored 100 points in a game right and it's a fascinating like fun system and it works for them because they can't recruit a lot mm -hmm. but they haven't necessarily had a winning record over their seasons of doing it so in the short term you like go hey i've got a quick advantage here because the other teams aren't used to playing like this yeah but there might be in basketball like a way to play basketball that is the optimal way of playing over the long term that breeds long-term mm -hmm. success that they aren't playing so as humans i have i mean i totally believe as a christian there is an optimal way to abide in the right ordering of God's intended order for creation. And there's a way that I run against the grain, right? Mm -hmm. The the old Darwinist story would say, <clears throat> the old Darwinist story would say, this story is in competition with the Christian story. And I'm saying, I don't think it is. I think we've wrongly interpreted the, the Dar old Darwin story, the, the social Darwinist story. And the more I think we embrace and explore the world with God's faculties of general revelation, the grace that he's given to all humankind, the more I think we'll be able to find patterns that point to the rules of the game actually look like a slain lamb yes. enthroned as king of the universe. Right. Because the answer is like, so who's the alpha, who's the real alpha male? Yeah. Yeah. Who could, who could and who should be in charge in a way that could last forever? Yes. Right. 
And and I think that this is super interesting. I'm gonna have an when, altar call right now. <laughs> <laughs> because when you think about like classical attributes of God, one of them is like we always attribute being to God, like not that God is, but God is the source of being, right? Yeah. And this weird paradoxical way, it's not even quite right to say that God is. God is that from which is comes. Yes. Uh, God is that from which being comes. Yes. Okay. God is that from which goodness comes, truth, beauty, etc. You know, those sorts of kind of platonic or other Christian sort of virtues that we attribute to God. And so being itself then, it, and being and goodness are two aspects of the divine, you could yes. even say. And so what has to be good is what has to be able to be for the longest possible time. And we could even say infinite possible time. And so evolution is like this, I was going to say competition, um, but even then that is betraying perhaps not quite the right word. Process. It, process, better. Um, that is revealing through time more and more of this pattern of goodness, because that which is able to be is that which is good, is that which is beautiful, is that which is true. And that it's almost as if like the flakes are falling off of the finished product over time and it's entropy that blasts it. And that which is able to withstand entropy is the gold which can go through the furnace. I, I'm I'm getting charismatic here. Go, ahead, go for it, go for it. <laughs> man. I'm let altar call right now. Baptism of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. We're gonna do all of that right here, right now. That that was, that's it, Sam. I'm I'm lighting up hearing that. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. So then the question becomes like, well, why the process? Why? Yeah. Why not the instantaneous? And so like to throw in just a brief theodicy that I think would it, maybe uh, this is not gonna do it total justice but that actually is akin to something origin suggested without all of origins metaphysics and ontology origin suggested <clears throat> origin suggested that there was a a fall of the spirits a fall of rational minds right in that this present age functioned as like a hospital for souls mm -hmm. now I don't agree with him on the, the metaphysics and ontology, but I do think there's something fascinating about this. If there were to be things that were not in and of themselves infinite, right? So there is only one uh, uh, actuality, pure actuality. Everything else is contingency. So by its definition, us, we as contingent beings derive our own sense of being from that which is is constantly existing. If we were to continue to constantly exist in harmony with what you're talking about, the harmonization of our existence, the union of it with all that's true, good, and beautiful, and yet, and yet we also maintain, I hope I don't lose people on this, we maintain that distinction between that which is actuality and that which has potentiality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What we would need to get to, if we were going to get to a an epoch in creation in which all that exists are different shades of the good, the true, and the beautiful, that we still can use our potentiality, our potentiality to choose from without choosing the perversion of the true, good, and beautiful. Yeah. What we would need to do is we would, I would imagine, God's process would be to have a particular age in which our nature, human nature, like universal shared human nature, goes through a process of seeing the effects of using our potentiality to choose the perversions of the good, the true, and the mm -hmm. beautiful in such a way that when that day comes and where human nature is fully united to the second atom, mm -hmm. we will be able to exist in a state where we are still have our potentiality. We still have our will, our free will to yeah, choose. No. But it will be so transformed through this process that all we will willingly choose are like different variations of the good instead of perversions yeah. of good. So I'm at an all you can eat buffet that God has made and deemed as good. Everything in it is good. Sin is not taking a cookie before having, you know, my meatloaf. Sin is taking everything that's in the buffet and dumping it on the floor. 
That is a perversion. It's going against the intended order that God has. So, in and the so of, is making a warrior cult. Yes, in Scandinavia that exactly. goes and conquers everybody. Yeah. Yes. So, what could happen if my nature, our nature, is so transformed to be like Christ that we would only will the good, and we go to that buffet and we take from all of the goodness? I can see an age to come in which we still retain what we might call free will, but our natures are so transformed that we have no temptation left in us to take the stuff from the buffet and dump it on the floor because we go, yes. that's a waste. Uh, Maximus the Confessor has an idea that is like so in line with this that it's almost like, I, I, it's weird that sometimes the older Christians are easier to harmonize with evolutionary theory totally. than the newer Christians. Totally. It's a little bit weird that way. It's like, so why were these people in like the two, three, and four, and five hundreds easier for me to reconcile their theology with Darwinism? They got myth better. They got myth better, and they got hierarchy and perhaps yeah. and and allegory and other things yeah. like that. And and Maximus the Confessor, he has this. I'll, I'll just I won't try and use the Greek words. He has like a deliberative will and like an instinctual will distinction and right now we we have kind of both and that we deliberate like as in like when we're choosing between options oh man i'm at the buffet do i want the chicken or the fish or the steak or the shrimp right we're, we're trying to do our best to use our mind to approximate or estimate or predict what is in the direction of that goodness um but over time like our will gets sort of instinctualized like there are some decisions that you, you know, you wake up in the morning, you go to the bathroom, you brush your teeth. It's like so habituated that you're almost like not deliberating about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And our goal is that our deliberative will will kind of eventually sort of collapse into an, an instinctual will. And that our divinization, our sanctification mm -hmm. is aligning our deliberative will with God's will such that it habituates into a will that's perfectly in line with God without needing to think about it. Yes, that's it. Yeah. Can yeah. I read a passage of scripture? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Not to get preachy here, uh, to get my preacher voice on. But, uh, you know, I mentioned this before we even hit record that you know, these conversations about fitness to habitat is their goal and tell us for evolution. It's been bringing me to first Corinthians 15, 12 to 58. This is an extended passage, but if you don't mind me reading it, Go Sam, because it. I think it's, it'll connect all of this together potentially. Only and if here, you explain what baptism on behalf of the dead is. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll set that one aside momentarily, but okay. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So I'll pause there and to say I think Paul's emphasis is if this doesn't lead about to the final culmination and restoration of all things for your bodies and this physical world, this has all been like a, a, a useless intellectual exercise. Uh, continuing on then. More than that, verse 15, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But did he not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised? For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life, if only for this life, we have hope in Christ. We are of all people most to be pitied. All right. Now this to me is where he gets like super cosmic, right? Yeah. But if Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, for since death came through a man, the righteousness of the dead comes also, or the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Now, Obviously, people we wrestle with this like, okay, well, if if evolution has sin and predation and, and and things before there even was possibility for a historical Adam, what happens? But if we can think like typologically here, right, and mythically, archetypally, we can see Adam as the prototype of humanity. And we say humanity brings about this sort of separation to go through Athanasius, right? Athanasius is like our sins bring us in a trajectory from order 
I'm paraphrasing him here to non-existence. Yeah. Right. Yep, yep. So Christ steps, very similar to what we were just saying, right? Exactly. Christ sin steps is in. an orientation towards destruction and non-existence. Yeah. Yes. So there is a pot, there's this orientation that this trajectory of our selfish appetites, many of the things that we do inherit through. And I wish somebody in all my like middle school purity talks and youth group would have helped me understand that I have millions of years of evolution, not just as humans, but as uh, we can go back to the mammals and say, as mm -hmm. soon as that testosterone kicks in, not only am I becoming more aggressive, but my testosterone is signaling to me, yeah, you should, you should uh, propagate as much of your kind as you possibly can. I wish I would we have a lot of Viking in us because we're a mix of strategies that work in the long term and those that work in the short term. Yes. But some of those short term strategies are the ones that lead to destruction. Yes. But there is still enough of us that's been made it through the last however many millions of years that is oriented towards the good. And so we have this mix yes. of oriented towards the good or oriented towards short term facility facility. Facil facil that fake versions, yep. <laughs> fake versions of the good that are actually short term beneficial strategies that lead to destruction, like Viking rape conquest yes. urge or, or whatever you want to call it. So yeah. if we can think of Adam more typologically as human nature and Christ mm -hmm. as the new, not new, but the intended telos for human nature. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But each in turn, Christ back to verse 23, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God to the father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now it says everything has been put under him. It's clear there's not include God himself who puts everything under Christ. But when he has done this, the son himself will made subject to him who put everything under him. So God may be all in all. I know there's a lot we can unpack there, Sam. <laughs> Verse, I'll refrain. I'll yeah, refrain, refrain momentarily <laughs> so we can stay stay in the flow of this yeah, conversation. Sure. Yes. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are we baptized for them? We'll pause on that. <laughs> yeah, but okay, we'll stay, we'll stay too. in this topic. And as for us, we endanger ourselves every hour. We face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I fought wild beast in Ephesus with no more than human hopes. What have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let's eat, drink, and uh, eat, drink, eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Dave Matthews, right? Yeah, or, or, or the or the that that Japanese philosopher's hedonism, right? Yes, like, that you were talking about the what? Let us flow state for tomorrow we die. You know? Yeah, Hungarian, yeah. Yeah. Hungarian philosopher. Yeah. Oh, Hungarian, not Hungarian Japanese. psychologist, I should say. Yeah. Okay. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses and stop sinning, for there are some who are arrogant of God. All right, but some will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will they come? How foolish. This is where, to me, it gets really weird, Sam. Yes. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. So seed analogy, like something starts small, it's going somewhere, but God gives it a body as he is determined and to each kind of seed, his own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh. Animals have another. Birds have another and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has a kind of splendor, the moon another and the stars another and the stars differ from star and star differs from star and splendor. So it will be, <laughs> this is really helpful, Apostle Paul, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead that the body, the body that is sown perishable is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So it was written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth and is the, and is the heavenly man. So also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. That's 
Paul's prescription for the telos of humankind. Yep. He's bearing and the, the, the stages of creation. The stages yeah. of creation. And I, like, and and that death is part of it. Like, yes. Like for me, what, what I, I I love that you brought up this passage because I think you're absolutely right that this is by far the most interesting and relevant passage to this discussion. The way I think about creation and new creation is that idea that there's sort of the polar bear in the sky, as I talk about with John Verveke, that's been tugging in a telos magnetism kind of way. It is what the polar bears are after. It was very interesting in my conversation with Jonathan Losos, he already mentioned. Um, he talked about ecomorphs, right? That there are like the reason why there are these similar converging species is it's almost like there's an ecomorph. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, so you're saying there's a platonic ideal yes. that is above any particular environment that the horned lizard in Australia and the horned lizard in Arizona are both trying to grab after that horned lizard in the sky, the platonic horned lizard. You the could emanating say. pressures meeting the emergent causation, yes. causation at yes. both levels. I'm doing Verveke hands now. Right, Verveke hands. And <laughs> if you could ever be the embodiment of the perfect horned lizard in the sky, well, then what need would there be for future evolution? What right. there, what need would there be for death and rebirth and mutation and stuff like that? If you were the poor, perfect horned lizard, you could be a perfect horned lizard for forever. In the same way, how much the more so could you be? A, what would the perfect human be like? And when Paul's talking about heavenly bodies, I mean, you have to kind of bust out your like early platonic cosmology sure. to know that they thought that the the earth, the heavenly bodies were more divine. Right. They like when he's talking about the sun and the moon. And again, this is one of those things where it's like, OK, our worldview is different than theirs. We think the moon is just a bunch of dust in the sky that's similar to our dust. They thought the sun and the moon were like more divine because they were closer to God mm -hmm. and that they were kind of an eternal form of body. So he's like Jesus has become in his resurrected state, this eternal kind of human. He's a heavenly human. He's got a body, but it's like not like this kind of lower thing. It's a perfect body. Mm -hmm. And we are being conformed to the image of that perfect body. And Jesus is the first fruits. And for me, this is like this weird time thing. I'll get into Christology a little bit. Like, okay, did Jesus pre-exist? Well, the Christ telos has always existed. Mm -hmm. And that has been tugging us in the direction of perfect humanity the whole time. So in a certain sense, it's back in the beginning, but in a certain sense, it's in the future. Mm -hmm. And Alpha and Omega. Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, and that Jesus becomes like the incarnated perfect version of that at his resurrection. And we don't, we can't become that now because we still have too much first man, mm -hmm. but we get like Christ in us now. So we have a version of the perfect man in us that's still wrestling with our old man. And in the resurrection, the old man will be taken off. It'll be like the shell that cracks open to reveal the new man within us. Mm -hmm. There we go. Christology and uh, evolution fit together. We did it. <laughs> we did it. And the, the mentioning of seeds here again and, and Jesus' yeah. frequent invocation of seeds in his parables. The genetic information for the mustard tree is contained in the mustard seed. Mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. so the, the the pattern the, the the future reality is already there in the present or even in the we could say the past so if you're standing from the vantage point of someone who has planted a mustard seed and you are between the planting of the seed and it's sprouting into the tree you are living between two realities that still have the encoded information in the beginning bringing it to into the future and yeah. so i think this is paul's point is like we are we live in that space between the two and then for me the wild thing about this is he gets all metaphysical but then he brings it back down to community instructions and exhortations right. at the end of this section which is here's the conclusion right like like basic boring bible teacher 101 verse 58 therefore and you always go well, what's yeah. the therefore right <laughs> Therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So embody that future ideal in your present community. And this is, Sam, for me, why like anybody 
man, I know it's hard to find a church community. I know how hard it is. And I know there's different shapes of church community, whether it's meeting in a home, whether you're going to the divine liturgy in an Eastern Orthodox church community, whether you're in a low church like mine, I know there's different shapes of it, but you need to be in a community where the environmental pressures are producing with the partnership of the spirit, these adaptations in you. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, yes. so the church community then becomes an environment by which you adapt to that environment, which is then adapting to Christ, which is the head. So, it's and you're both theology. helping shape the environment, but also being shaped by the environment. Yes, and that's the co-shaping, yeah. the co-shaping mm -hmm. of it, and that's this beautiful picture of Christ as the head of the church. Is like it's not that we're going to have, it's not going to look perfect in your church community. I promise you that. But like that's the thing. I go back and be like, man. Mr. Peterson, Dr. Peterson, I would love for you. I know it'd be really difficult with your stature and fame. Find a church community yeah. and get plugged in because the environment you're surrounding yourself in, um, a yeah. person that's really wanting, like they like this idea, find the right Christian community that has that story. And you can look around. The thing you should look for is not, is the preaching slick? Is the music awesome? You're looking for people who have Christian virtues. Mm -hmm. And then when you step into that community, what you're going to find as adaptation. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that community together is adapting to the highest pattern in Christ. Mm -hmm. You're adapting to that environment. And now these yeah. traits are being changed in you. And this is how I've seen even in like my great grandfather. Um, my great grandfather was a raging alcoholic that left my grandmother. My grandfather mm -hmm. decided he was kind of nominally Catholic, but he decided he was going to not have that pattern repeat itself. Mm -hmm. And he created a new environment in his home. Now, my dad then and his adult life, you know, it wasn't Catholicism, but he he had a transformative like Augustinian conversion, a born again experience. And so I am I am a byproduct of someone's putting themselves into a new environment, which produced new adaptations in them. And so now the new norm in my family lineage is you go to church mm -hmm. and you worship. Mm -hmm. And there are not just that, but in your life, there are moral expectations that aren't even like, some of them I don't even have, we don't even have to work on with our kids. That's going to sound yeah. weird. Getting that into the instinctual will instead of having it always have to live in the deliberative yes. will. So yeah. when we first moved to our first neighborhood, and I can wrap up with this Sam and we can pick up another mm -hmm. time too. When we first moved to our neighborhood, our kids engaging with our, our neighbors who are presently not like in any sort of church community. And one of the coolest things we heard from them, and we are not taking personal credit for this, coolest things we heard from them was we love when our kids hang out with your kids because it brings out the best of our kids. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. What's awesome about that wasn't like me and my wife going like, we we came up with the perfect parenting mm -hmm. model. We don't do like all the things Christian parents say you're supposed to do with daily family devotionals and stuff like that. But they have been in environments. I have been environments, just multiple generations of people in our family line on both sides, my wife and our family and our present context is making them adapt to those environmental pressures, environmental pressures, but the norms in which people are, the expectation is Christian virtue. Yes. And so get into that, see how it scales and see how it continues to reproduce and see how over the long haul it produces a more victorious outcome for that in that uh, group selection competition game because yeah. i think in the end the promise is of all the group selection games what we're going to have is a new humanity that looks like christ so why don't you get into that game now yes yeah mm -hmm. and it'll kill you but it'll also be the thing that saves you yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah short term versus long term trade-off right right yeah death and life at the same time yep yeah all right I can't think of a better note to end on than that. Let's end on that. Yep. <laughs> Paul, this was super fun. This super is exactly fun. the sort of conversation I love oh, having. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. All right.